Hi, I'm Dr. Allison Cole, the creator and host of the Sleep is My Waking Passion podcast, pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine specialist here to talk to you about the sleep year in review for 2025. If I had to name one thing that really sticks out to me in the year 2025, it's noticing just how many providers interested in sleep, dentists interested in sleep, therapists interested in sleep. There's this whole evolution that's going on in the public sector about the awareness and importance of sleep as being a key construct to helping us live a longer, more productive, healthier life. That is absolutely amazing to me. And I wanted to start off by talking about sleep and brain health. Every year I try to attend the sleep conference, which is the national conference put on by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine in, in conjunction with the Sleep Research Society. Preliminary research is now looking at Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia disorders and how sleep may be impacting those disorders, trying to establish what that relationship is. What we are discovering is the importance of various stages of sleep in helping us process memories, retain information, and the importance even of slow wave sleep and the glymphatic system of our brain and how sleep may play an instrumental role in clearing out some of the toxins that accumulate during the day as we're awake for longer and longer hours. Sleep might actually be a key built-in detox system for our brains. And this may be really important for us being able to maintain our brain health long-term, especially if we focus on consistency. That's been another topic of conversation this year, which is getting consistent sleep may potentially be even more important, dare I say, than the number of hours that we get to sleep. It all matters, not getting enough hours, getting inconsistent sleep, having fragmented sleep when we do sleep. So in other words, a poor sleep quality, all of that factors into how our brains operate. High quality, consistent sleep could become essentially one of the most powerful tools that we have for long-term health. I also want to talk about the exciting time that we've had in 2025 in the women's sleep health arena. This has been a major um, topic of discussion within the American Academy of Sleep Medicine community. There's been a lot of advocacy surrounding identifying women who may have sleep disordered breathing, what we also refer to as obstructive sleep apnea. It tends to be woefully underdiagnosed. And what we know is the clinical presentation for women can be different than men. Women often may have disrupted sleep at night. They may be complaining more of insomnia symptoms. What we're also paying attention to is how sleep changes over the lifespan of a woman. When we're prepubescent, our sleep kind of mirrors that of boys. Boys and girls kind of sleep the same. But once we start hitting puberty and our hormones start to shift, this is where we start to see a real split between the quality of sleep that young ladies get versus young men that are going through puberty. And then even more complex is the relationship between how we sleep during pregnancy potentially. And what we're knowing more and more about is the impact of obstructive sleep apnea on the pregnant patient and how it's trickier to identify the pregnant patient, but they are much higher risk for having issues related to um, worse fetal outcomes. They may be at higher risk for having preeclampsia or eclampsia, for example. So there can be some serious health risks, both mom and baby, that are slowly but surely being further studied, further elucidated, and further emphasized, which is wonderful to see. The other aspect that's really important is just knowing that as we hit perimenopause, ladies are going to become an increased risk for having sleep apnea because estrogen and progesterone, those hormones actually protect the airway. They help to stabilize the upper airway. And as our hormones fluctuate and eventually decline, we start to see a substantial increase in the risk of obstructive sleep apnea for women. So the fact that we're linking hormones to what could happen with our airway and emphasizing the importance of not just living with insomnia and bad sleep as we get older, but saying, how can we be more open-minded about our choices? Hormone replacement therapy may be a much more appropriate option for women than we used to discuss. I also want to touch base on kids, teens, and even folks that are doing shift work. What do they all have in common? Well, in the United States especially, but this is not a problem that's just a USA problem. It's a world problem. 
These are the populations that are highly vulnerable to the effects of chronic sleep deprivation, and they happen to be the most sleep deprived. Kids going to school very early, out of sync with their natural circadian rhythm, which as we get to be teenagers tends to get delayed where we want to stay up later and sleep in later. Making kids go to high school when it is still dark outside, getting on a bus, some people 6, 6.30 in the morning is not aligned with a teenager's circadian rhythm. Shift workers, we know, maybe at increased risk for things like cancer. They may gain weight. They're more likely to have motor vehicle accidents. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that it is very difficult to work all day or all night out of sync with your natural circadian rhythm. Understanding that these are inextricably linked to see that we're discussing these topics even in government when it comes to later school start times or permanent standard time as opposed to permanent daylight savings time. It's been wonderful to see that a lot of the advocacy that I've been involved in and a lot of my colleagues have been involved in seems to be landing um, albeit a soft landing in government. We need to keep the dialogue going. And I'm excited for 2026 and what the American Academy of Sleep Medicine's Advocacy Committee will be up to, hopefully joining forces with some other really powerful and public sleep organizations promoting the importance of sleep health in Americans. There's also been some new guideline updates that are worth everyone knowing about. There have been new guidelines regarding insomnia. Yes, we have guidelines that outline cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia or behavioral strategies for insomnia, which we know work in a majority of patients. However, we also need better guidelines for how to responsibly use pharmacotherapy that are updated. We now have those. We also know patients who need both behavioral therapy strategies as well as medication, sometimes at the same time. How do we eventually get them off of medication? When it comes to dual therapy, there are new guidelines that address that. The Restless Legs updated guidelines finally came out, and it's been exciting because we are shifting the way we practice. This has always been something that was emphasized in my fellowship, but we never had any guidelines that mimicked the importance of really making sure there's adequate iron in your diet, because iron is a cofactor for making dopamine in the brain, which helps to regulate our leg movements. So it's been really nice to see some holistic strategies that are actually evidence-based make their way into updated guidelines. At the end of of the day, the future of sleep therapies is getting very, very exciting. We have a company like Onira Health that is making polysomnogram accessible at home. I'm also seeing more and more people start to embrace multi-night sleep testing, which we know is better than single night testing for sleep apnea. And I am hoping to see that make its way into mainstream practice. There are also very exciting avenues in research that are going on in rare disease, specifically narcolepsy type one that classically presents with excessive daytime sleepiness, sleep paralysis, perisleep hallucinations, what we call hypnagogic or hypnopompic hallucinations, as well as cataplexy, which is a very misunderstood aspect of type 1 narcolepsy. There are potentially new drugs on the horizon, specifically looking at the pathway of orexin 2 binding to the orexin 2 receptor to help to try to restore some normalcy. Uh, to the brain functioning when it comes to transitioning between sleep and wake. I'm going to be very curious to see where the future goes in 2026 in rare disease and sleep. The other exciting news in less rare disease, which is obstructive sleep apnea, a very common, one of the top three common sleep disorders that we deal with here in the United States. ApneMed now has a product that they are actively going to be publishing phase three results for. And their product is really two medications in one. And the idea behind these medications is that they synergistically help to stimulate upper airway muscle tone. So taking a pill to increase upper airway muscle tone to actually treat obstructive sleep apnea may become a reality in 2026. Time will tell. So my closing and call to action to you is that as I wrap up this year in review, I am 
left feeling incredibly inspired, and I hope you are too. If you'd like to learn more about any of the topics that I discussed, I'm going to be launching a new season of the Sleep is My Waking Passion podcast coming in January. You can check out any of my previous episodes, which feature some key notable figures in sleep medicine, as well as therapists and dentists giving you a broad perspective across specialties and areas of, areas of expertise in just how sleep influences our day-to-day -day life. They are available on YouTube, and my handle is at Ask the Sleep and